Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Shashi. I'm one of the pastors here at All Saints, Clayton. And I have the privilege of starting us off this week in our series from the letter of 1 Peter. Now, just as I've just explained, our reading was very short. It was only two verses, hence why I didn't have enough time to get my mic on. Which means, of course, that today's sermon will be nice and simple, short. We'll be able to go for lunch early, right? Well, even though any beginning of the letter is quite standard and simple, when we look a little bit closer, we find there's lots to learn from even these two verses. Any letter that we have tells us lots about the sender and the recipient. And in fact, this first verse of the letter of 1 Peter clearly gives us a relational, a geographical, and a theological map, a setting for us to understand the rest of the letter in. Now, the letter is written by Peter, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and he starts the letter by saying, to God's elect exiles. Now, during, I'm going to tell you about three different letters here. During COVID lockdown, both my children were at home with me. Charlie was aged eight, Charlotte was aged three. For those who were there with children, you remember those messy times, right? I came up with the idea that I would get my kids to write letters to friends, both near and far. It helped them practice their handwriting, for Charlie anyway. For Charlotte, as a three-year-old, she loved to draw. It improved her, what we call, uh, fine motor skills. And I had a lovely friend called Beck. Now, Beck really loved Charlotte. Charlotte really loved Beck. And Beck had moved from Glen Waverley down to Chelsea to work there in another church. And I'm going to tell you the secret of why Charlotte loved Beck so much. Beck had two cats called Mischief and Mayhem. Yes, she named them very purposely that way. And we were super excited during lockdown after Charlotte had sent a beautiful scribble off to Auntie Beck to receive this from Beck. Oh, sorry, from Mischief. I miss you too, Mischief. Please note, Mayhem's handwriting was very messy. Mischief's handwriting was very neat like this with cursive, as you can see. Beck understood that Charlotte was only three. She understood Charlotte didn't have a whole lot of writing and that she felt very lonely and isolated at home. Beck had found a way of entertaining and connecting emotionally with my three-year-old. And so, for a lot of that lockdown, we received letters from Mischief and Mayhem, which she loved and cemented Charlotte's love of Auntie Beck even more. Auntie Beck understood and knew who Charlotte was, knew what Charlotte needed. Now, in a similar way, the phrase might seem quite unimportant, quite small, but Peter starts his letter off with acknowledging who his recipients are, God's elect exiles. He knows exactly what he's doing and who he's writing to. Those chosen by God scattered around the world. This letter would go out to any number of communities and churches around the area. In those church groups, in those people group, there would have been some of those who had been expelled from Rome because of their faith. There would also have been those who had become Christians in their location. Some of those recipients would have been rich, some poor. Some may have even been denied jobs or treated in unkind ways because of their faith. There might have been some in Jewish groups or non-Jewish groups rich and poor, slave and free. So when Peter writes to God's elect exiles, he knows that he is creating a new group for them, 
all of them, no matter where they were from, because of their faith in Jesus, were elect, chosen by God, but exiles, because they didn't really belong here in their own earthly spaces. They were indeed elect exiles, not yet living in their true home. And Peter knew that along with them, he too was looking forward to the time when Jesus would return and he and the readers would no longer be exiles from the heavenly kingdom. Now, just as the recipients of this letter were foreigners in a strange land awaiting Jesus' return, I think we are a bit the same too. And Joel Green outlines this sort of contradiction. He writes, now it's not on the screen, I'm just going to read it out. They, the elect exiles, live in their respective countries, but only as resident aliens. They participate in all things as citizens, and they endure all things as foreigners. Every foreign territory is a homeland for them, but every homeland is a foreign territory. They live on earth, but participate in the life of heaven. They are obedient to the laws that have been made, and by their own lives, they supersede the laws. They love everyone and are persecuted by all. They are impoverished and make many rich. They lack all things but abound in everything. Can you hear it? They are elect exiles caught in that in-between. I suspect lots of us can connect to that too. As followers of Jesus, Peter's audience were indeed elect exiles, and Peter connects them together through this shared identity. Exiles in this world. And I would actually say many of us here today would count ourselves in that group too. Well, letter number two. So actually I've jumped the slide. Here's letter number two. I have been a letter writer since very young, since the age of five, to be exact. When we first moved, uh, left China, we moved to the US and I met, and my mum met, a lovely gentleman called Joey the Grandpa. That was pretty much his name. He lived in New Haven, Connecticut. And he was actually part of one of the volunteers at an English class where my mum went to go and learn English, not unlike Dixon House. Joey, the grandpa, and I became pen pals. And we would send each other letters. He often sent me books as well, uh, no matter where I was. I would you know, tell him different things as I got older. He would pretty much just always say the same thing. Ah, yes, I remember Crocodile Dundee. Um, <laughs> and put a shrimp on a barbie. Um, and we kept writing to each other up until about 2007, which is when I suspect he passed away. For me, Joey the grandpa was kind of this set place in the world because we moved house so much. As Joey the grandpa said, I was one of the most well-traveled people he knew. Writing became harder and harder for him as he got older. But one thing he always did was he sent me stickers with his name and address on it. Jo Joseph McGloin, 18 Tower Lane, New Haven, Connecticut. And I knew that no matter where our family moved, I could always send him a letter to the same place because I had those stickers. When Peter writes to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, he knows who he's writing to and where he's writing to. That's a letter from Joey. Now, these letters, okay, let's try again. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. This type of letter was called a circular letter because it was sent around. It didn't go to only one place. And Peter's actually written the order of the places that it would go. So let's see again. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and across Asia and Bithynia. My circle is not that great. And so 
The courier would have gone around exactly in that order. When Peter writes that in his letter, they would have been going, oh, yeah, yeah, we're number three on the list or number one. I was trying to think, how would I explain that to all of the people here at All Saints? Well, we have a lot of people who live in a lot of different areas. <laughs> the furthest one I could think of was Fitzroy with Pearl and Jaya Deep. And we've got lots of people along the way, some in Oakley, some in Clayton. I know we have people in Burwood as well, and down in, uh, in Cranbourne and Clyde. We have people everywhere, and I think it would be really fun if we actually did send a circular letter. It might take a long time, though. The third letter I wanted to tell you about was from a gentleman called Andrew Olson. He was one of my lecturers at Bible College, and he's essentially my Charlie's grandpa as well. Now, because he was a Bible lecturer, he always sends letters that are a little bit theologically dense, but he knew my kids, he understood. And so we sent him letters during lockdown as well. He's moved to Perth since then. So it's always fun to get letters all the way from Perth. And his most recent letter, he did this drawing, oh, his letter from lockdown, he did this drawing to try and help Charlotte understand where she stood in her relationship with God. Yes, she still was only a three-year-old, so we were still reaching, but we try. <laughs> Each of these letters meant a lot to me, meant a lot to my family and to my kids. They helped us during COVID, which was kind of an exile, to orient ourselves, to remind us in this time of exile of who we are. They were relational, they were geographical, and they were theological. Peter, meanwhile, is a much better letter writer than all of us. He managed to do that in only two verses. To God's elect exiles, relational, through the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, geographical. And let's look at the theological. He reminds his readers that they are those who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. There's a lot to unpack there. His recipients of his letter were those who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That's huge to know that they were chosen by God before they ever realized. This past Wednesday, we finished up our course exploring Christianity. And I think a really difficult thing for someone who hasn't been a Christian, who hasn't read the Bible, is to realize that there's someone that much bigger than you, that they know you so well, they chose you. They know exactly what you're going to do. It's really hard to get your head around that. But also at the same time, such a comforting thing. And so uh, Thomas Schreiner says, those who understand themselves as God's elect or God's chosen ones have the ammunition to resist the norms and culture of the society they inhabit. For those Jewish Christians who'd been thrown out of Rome, for those who were living in a culture that didn't think much of their faith, knowing that God had chosen them, what ammunition, as Thomas Schreiner writes, to help them be okay with being different, to not give in to the social ideas around them. And I think for us, we need that sort of strength too, don't we? Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Not only that, they are the ones who through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, we'll finish that, but Peter's audience has been relocated in a new space, 
in the realm of holiness engendered by the Holy Spirit, emphasizing the activity of the Spirit and its results in the lives of those chosen through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Not only did God know you beforehand and choose you, but you are being made new, made clean and pure through the Holy Spirit. Finally, what made all of this possible? They are to be obedient to Jesus Christ, sprinkled with his blood. It is through Jesus' death on the cross that we just celebrated in communion that any of this has been made possible. For this variety of people from many places, many cultures and of various backgrounds, God has sanctified them through the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has died on the cross for them. God knew you from when you were before you were born. Those receiving this letter, whether at the beginning of the courier's delivery, delivery or at the end of the delivery route, whether reading the original manuscript or maybe the one in our pews right now, we can know that we were chosen by God. We are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit to be obedient for Jesus Christ and we are sprinkled with his blood. Now, this letter was circulated in a circular way. We too have received this letter in a very circular way. It's come all the way from Turkey, we think, written originally in marketplace Greek, translated however many times down through time and place so that we could read it today. Those people's hands that you shook during the greeting of peace, the names of the friends that you have at work, even when we look at the simple outreach things that we're doing here at All Saints, like mainly music, like the International Food Festival. I think when we look at the recipients of the letter and at ourselves, there's a lot of things we have in common. I suspect that for many of us here at All Saints, we have a similar experience. We're from a lot of different places in the world. L lots of people will look at me and go, oh yeah, you're Chinese. Even though my Chinese is only okay. Oh, yeah, you're from Australia, Melbourne, I can hear your accent. You're a social worker. Ah, so you're like that, huh? But all of us have a greater allegiance than any of those groups that we might belong to. We have a land that we are looking forward to because indeed we are elect exiles. And thanks to the work of Jesus, we can look forward to that coming kingdom. And so... At the end of today's verse, when Peter writes, grace and peace be yours in abundance, it is an amazing thing to be writing. Up till now, he's just been reminding us of who we are. And this is the big thing that he gives us. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. God is not stingy. In abundance. Joel Green tells us, to read 1 Peter is to be told not how we might think about God, but what God thinks about us. Here in 1 Peter is an invitation to adopt God's way of seeing things and to live accordingly. This entails refusing the conventions of honour and status that for many living in that original audience's world would have been the top priority. For us, it means that we have greater allegiance to Jesus Christ than any of these other things that we've been talking about. We live here on earth, but we participate in life in heaven. We're obedient to the laws here that have been made, but our lives, they supersede these laws. We lack all things, but abound in everything. 
We are indeed elect exiles like Peter's originally intended audience. We too live in a foreign land. So I read to you, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Footscray, of Clayton, of Cranburn, of Burwood, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. We are correspondents across space and time. And so as strangers in our homeland, as fellow correspondents, I'd like you this week to take time to write a letter as well. Maybe you can write one to someone you haven't talked to for a while at church. You should all have the uh, address book with all our letters and names in there. Maybe you can write to a friend you haven't spoken to for a while. In today's pew sheet, you'll see a little letter thing. I'll find one. Wait a sec. One of these. Now, you can use them if you want. If you don't want to and you think they're too ugly, that's fine. <laughs> but I want us to be encouraging one another, reminding each other of who we are in Christ. And as you write this letter, pray for the person you're writing to. Know that they too are a, a person in a specific time and place that needs reminding of who they are in Christ. Point them, however gently, however quietly, or if your relationship allows, maybe loudly, to the knowledge of who they are and who they can be in Christ. Saved by Jesus, part of God's elect peoples. Encourage them with the words that, they have been that we have been encouraged but with today. Father, we thank you so much that we are elect exiles together here on earth and we long for the day when your son returns. Please help us to be an encouragement to one another in pointing each other back to who we are through your son. And as we go into this week, may we continue to hold tightly uh, to that knowledge and not be distracted or drawn away by the world around us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.